Good evening. My name is Katie Jenkins. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture. And this semester, I have the good fortune to be coordinating the Glimpshire Seminar with tonight's speaker. With the generous support of Herb and Dee Dee Glimpshire, this professorship invites a critical voice from landscape architectural practice to engage with students and faculty at the Knowlton School. Tonight, I am delighted to introduce this year's Glimpshire Distinguished Visiting Professor, Mick Young Kim. Mick Young asserts that her work is not art, but firmly representative of landscape architectural practice. Yet, one can infer upon looking at her work why it might be necessary to make such an assertion. Her designed landscapes offer immersive multi-sensory experiences, but they are also civic spaces and ecological filters, sites of communal engagement and sanctuaries for reflection and healing. The complex visual rhythms that make McYoung's landscapes pulse are to be certain a product of the diverse artistic media that saturate her process. Indeed, McYoung possesses fluency across a range of modes of artistic expression. Her background in music and sculpture is evident in the way that she deploys melodic and aesthetic language to her descriptions of landscape. Through her process of translation, these lyrical undertones become spatial sequences of light and color, steel and stone. It is this assimilation of influences that for me locates her work at the apex of landscape architectural practice. It is a further testament to her commitment to site that her built projects do not retain the typical signatures that so often punctuate the work of designers regardless of that work's context. Rather, she gives voice to the site and the materials used to augment it. In her conversations with students here at OSU, she has given insight into a process that precludes the possibility of repeating herself. With every project, the site is changed, the conditions are changed, and she is changed. None of this can be easy, and yet this year alone, her firm has been awarded the prestigious Cooper Hewitt National Design Award and the American Society of Landscape Architects National Design Medal. My students have remarked that although the work they are undertaking this semester with Mick Young is demanding, it is simultaneously restorative, a reprieve from other obligations. Learning from Mick Young is much like discovering her landscapes. It generates energy, nourishes the imagination, and leaves one eager for further encounters. So please join me in welcoming Mick Young Kim. Thank you very much. When I hear um, these, thank you, Katie, for the lovely introduction to Dorte for inviting me. I've, I've already been here once and met some really great students, did some workshops. Um, I always, when I hear these introductions, I always think, who is that person? I'd like to meet them. <laughs> um, I'm so honored to be here, and thank you um, to the Knowlton School for inviting us. Um, I, um, my background is both in design and music, and um, I think it does shape the work that we do as an office. Um, I wanted to just start off with a kind of caveat, because I think there is this myth about um, the kind of designer, the kind of top-down, sketch on the napkin, you know, um, designer that doesn't look like me. You know, they're usually a little bit taller, and they <laughs> um, And I think what the work that I'm going to share today, I wanted just to kind of frame it, is that it is, it emerges out of a kind of a larger collaborative discussion. What's collaboration? Because that's a word like that IBM uses, and everything. <laughs> so I, I think it it means that it's 
it's a larger group of people. I'm here today, but there is a group of people within my office and then a group of people who are part of a larger team who make these projects possible. So the bigger the project that I show you today, the more likely that my part is in, uh, is a kind of, um, I've, I've been calling it a tapestry over the last year, but I think it's something that's more active. It's more like, a, today I was thinking as we were doing crits this afternoon, that's more like a dance. It's like working with other people. So what does collaboration mean? It's sort of like dancing with a lot of people. I'm not a very good dancer, but I'm a good collaborator. <laughs> so, um, so that's, you know, I think um, I come from a background that is more unconventional. I didn't study design in my undergrad degree, but I think that it shapes the vision that we have together in our office. What I wanted to do tonight was um, I selected a few projects that talk about, because um, some of you may be graduating, some of you will be, all of you will be entering the, um, the world of practice. And in our office, there's a way in which we don't, uh, we don't have a kind of singular style that, that defines the brand of the firm, but also that concurrently we're working on multiple scales and often really contrasting scales. And it's becoming more and more contrasting as, um, as we grow as an office. So now we're working on a project that's tableware for Swarovski crystals, and then on the other end of the spectrum, a 385-acre master plan in uh, Morocco. And so those two drawings and their kind of um, insistence sit at our table. And I wanted to share with you how we work and how, um, how it kind of, it's, it's like a fractal, you know, that the work, um, that each work has a dialogue with each other and that the kind of variety of scales I think is very important for designers, whether you're an architect, landscape architect, uh, or an interior designer. So to start, um, I've kind of framed these, and these are the first three projects. One is in Korea, and I think that's the mark of another that's unique, I think, to the practice now, is that we do work all around the world. And so it requires a lot of listening and learning and understanding what it means to make a place. So I've selected kind of two, one kind of urban civic plaza, one smaller garden, and one um, larger seven and a half mile river restoration project, all that happened in the same time period. So this is in downtown Seoul in South Korea, and Korea's been in the news a great deal. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a major city. It's one of the largest um, urban centers in the world and in Southeast Asia. Um, and what we did was, um, hmm, that's sharpening. Um, our work is about kind of um, bringing together all these different c conditions. So it's understanding, I don't know if my eyes are, it's a little blurry. It's a little blurry to you guys? It's a little blurry. So, um, <laughs> um, so every project that we work on in landscape architecture has this kind of component of understanding what the systems of the site are. And in, in South Korea, it's all about water. So if you're there in August, this could be happening. But it's not just in South Korea, right? It's, uh, what is it, Hurricane Florence. We're doing a botanic <coughs> garden in Charlottesville. It's this, this idea of where does water go? And so that was question number one in this project is there's a resiliency pro problem in the middle of downtown Seoul. Um, what do we do about it? So just to give you a little context, this is North Korea, this is South Korea. This is a night view. Um, when you fly over from the US to Korea, you can see this kind of delineation. Um, and our site is here. We, we were awarded this project as, a, as part of an international competition. And it's the source point of the seven and a half mile river. 
which feeds into the Han River. So it's a, it's a green corridor in the middle of the city. Just uh, zoom in. So the, the piece of the project that we, uh, we drew up and we designed in the competition is two major city blocks. They call them super blocks in South Korea, in downtown Seoul. And it's their financial district. But just to go through, um, in the early 20th century, this is a country that went through, um, because geographically where it's located, it's, um, you know, it, it was a war-torn city. And just as a, um, a testament to this country, they were within, um, from that period of time to today, be able to transform this country in South Korea. So this tiny little country got divided into two tiny little countries. And then South Korea became, I think it's like the sixth largest economy in, in Asia. And um, Seoul is a very busy city. But this is actually a historic photo. So I wanted to, the, the, the lecture should have been called like the kitchen sink because it's going to have lots of different things in it because I feel like I wanted to share with you a little bit of like our dirty underwear, or no. Um, <laughs> I don't know how that came out wrong. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's not happening tonight. Um, just to show you a little bit of our process. OK, so one of the things we do is we go to a place and we do a lot of historical analysis. We don't talk about it much at these lectures, but in order to, have, to feel that we have the right to work in Morocco and Korea and Hong Kong and Charlottesville, we have to get to know the place. Some of it is research, some of it is spending time with people. So these are some, this is the Chungay River, and these are historical photos during the war. So this is um, a river that, um, Historically, the reason why Seoul was placed there was because of this natural um, stream. And for uh, you know, 450 or to 500 years, just urban effluence flowed directly into this river. And so it became a shanty town during the war. And then they covered it like how they did in many cities. They covered it with a highway. So this is a picture in the 1968 of them building kind of this vision of, like they did this in Boston too, this vision of like uh, progress in the city. So they built this highway that basically divided the city in half. So this is uh, an image of uh, the river and the source point of the river and the different, so some of the diagrams that we, di we did. Um, essentially this, is a green infrastructural park, but it also accommodates about 22,000 tons of surficial runoff on average every day. So it collects runoff from the subway systems and from the city itself. So it's essentially this area is like this glorified stormwater basin. I've forgotten what the statistic is, but there are a lot of people who live in Seoul. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, know, I remember, I just remembered. Um, per square meter, there's 17, on average, 17,600 people per square meter in Korea. That's including like wherever you're standing, all the stuff that's happening below. So it's like six times denser than New York City. So it's a lot of people. And these are just some images of the process. So just in terms of construction, in, in Boston, this project would have taken three decades to build. And in Korea, in South Korea, it took five years. No, that doesn't include design time, but construction. So this was the first project where I learned that landscape has the capacity to have a political voice. Because the mayor at that time Who's, who, this was uh, his baby, this was his idea. Um, he eventually went on to become president. I'm not taking credit for his, <laughs> for his success, but um, so you can see this is the highway that basically bisects the city 
and they basically dismantled the entire highway and then reinstalled this. So this project had a lot of impact, it, and all landscapes have that capacity. Um, particularly in the city, there's a social impact, and I'm not going to bore you by reading this, but just basically there's a kind of cultural impact that these projects can have. And the idea of this project is that it's a, it's a kind of canvas or a foundation by which people can lay their own uh, programming and cultural aspirations. I think that's like Buddha's birthday or something. So a lot of the pictures I'm going to show you about this from this project are not pictures we photographed. They're not staged, but they're from like Instagram and other social media. Um, there's, there was a huge environmental impact of um, improving air quality, um, reducing the kind of heat island effect, and then bringing in about 230 different species of birds and flora and fauna. And then it makes money, you know, and that's, it sounds a little crass, I know, but it's, it's an important component um, to these uh, public spaces because without that kind of um, revenue generation, the, the space dies. You need some kind of interface between the two. And so within this project, there was um, basically it spurred all of this development. When we looked at the project, you know, they, uh, we got this plan which said, okay, here's the river. But we started saying, well, the river still disconnects one part of the city from the other. So we were part of a much larger discussion which included their Army Corps of Engineers, a slew of local landscape architects and architects, and understanding how we could start to reconnect neighborhoods together. This was a very important project, and so within this uh, diagram, um, this wasn't our idea, but it was part of the project, and I want to share it with you, was to bring back the kind of some of the historic pedestrian bridges, and also to make this zone a pedestrian zone, so it got transformed from a highway to a kind of pedestrian zone, which had these historic, some which were actually uh, the, the literal, historic stones, and others which were refabrications. Re I think there's a real desire in South Korea to bring, back, um, to, to bring back some of the rituals that made their culture um, vibrant. And so this was a first step. So this is uh, underneath the bridge, walking underneath. And so, um, just wanted to show you, you know, we always show these glossy photos of, of what the project is. And in all the projects I'm going to show today, I wanted to show a little bit of our process. And so one of the big ideas that won us the competition was that there are nine provinces in North and South Korea. And um, we were proposing to have the nine provinces donate stones from their quarries. So there'd be nine provinces, nine stones, we'd cleft the stones, then there'd be nine source points. Nine. So each one of these, so the symbol is that the source point of the river is a kind of symbol of the reunification of these two countries. Um, three years ago when I used to give this lecture and talk about this project, I, would, I said, it's a long way off from 1985 when the two countries marched together um, in the Olympics, who knows? Who knows what could happen next? But they, um, they do talk about how when the two countries reunify that they will celebrate it at the source point. We build a lot of physical models, really old fashioned, really fast, and helps, and it's a very good collaborative tool. So this is that air dry clay, means that when you're working on it together, we put saran wrap on top of it. Um, we can move things around when we're working together. Um, everybody knows how to move clay around. 
So as we're working on this, we're also developing renderings. And this is showing at different levels um, how this sunken um, source point actually fills up. So these are the, the stones, and these are the different source points of the different provinces. I know it's really strange, right? You see these like drawings, and then you're like, ta-da, here it is. But it's, it's you know, it's a, I've been reading this biography of Louis Kahn, and he calls it a grind, and it is. It's, a, it's like not magic. It is, it's this process, and you have to be persistent. So it's this process of going from that drawing to this. And so it was this, and it's become this, and in August it becomes that. So a lot of people have asked me, I'm going to go back. Oh, no, I'm not going back. Sorry. Um, I'll, show, I'll point it to you later. Remind me if I don't. But look at these walls and this stair. A lot of people say, well, why did you think that? Why don't you bring it to grade? Remember I was talking about that kind of glorified basin? This is this. This is after a storm. And these are some pictures from online of during the storm, how this place. And so when we first designed this, we wanted all this plant material in there. And, and just imagine a couple times a year this happens, just fills up. And so the engineers basically, well, I flew to Korea because I was younger and more stubborn. And I said, you've got to have some plant material in here. And you've got to do this. And have some lights. And you've got to give it life. And uh, I lost. Um, so we redesigned it to be more with stonework. And the first year, the, uh, one of the Army Corps of Engineers, he sent me this image. He was like, see? Um, but on an everyday basis, what I have seen people do is when they're walking to work, let's say they usually come from here, they'll come down off the street. So it must be opposite of the high line. And then they'll go into this more cooler environment and they come up to, to wherever they're working. So they'll come off of the street. But it's a, for Korea, this is a huge commitment. For us, it seems like just this little sliver. But if you just imagine, each meter has 17,600 people in it. This is a big commitment by the city. I'm gonna. And it's a very highly used space. Um, they have festivals here and lots of different kinds of activities. It's also in the summertime a beach. I love this kid, <laughs> right? Can't you just feel how great that feels? And then just this is the high level, mid level. And so the whole design, yeah, like it's kind of scary how many people are, are going into the water. But it's, um, the water was brought to a class two level, so safe for people to, to hang out. So for 100 years or hundreds of years, this was a river that was dangerous to engage with. And so um, it's a place where a lot of different things are happening. And so the design is uh, essentially, you can see from this side that we really simplified it. And it's basically taking the pathway and just bending it down and creating these ramps that take you to the water. Really simple idea, bring you to the water um, with stone that was donated by North and South Korea to create this very powerful symbol. This is a photo I found online. It's like two kids boogie boarding, so cute. And so what happens from the source point as it moves out, it becomes more and more planted, more and more. There's a diversity of experiences. And that's because it's not in the heart of the city where, those kind of where they have to manage those kind of intensive storms. This is blurry, too. 
Um, this is a place, I believe that civic space is still should be a place where the democratic voice is heard. And so this is a place where when there was an outbreak of mad cow disease, people came and um, they didn't want to buy our beef because <laughs> it was the outbreak was here. Um, <laughs> and then it's a place of joy. It's a place where art installations can happen, where you celebrate Buddha's birthday. You and then from the upper level, looking down and. Um, you know, another really adorable kid. I should just like fill these with puppies and just show you guys pictures of puppies. Um, and then this is a million, they call it a million man, but I'm sure there's some women in there, a million person march when there was a scandal. You may have read about it in the paper, the uh, president, what, a year and a half ago, stepped down because she was getting bad advice from strange people or something. and so. Um, this is the Chang'e River, and it's a fit, fits a lot of people. So that's a big project, lots of people making a big impact. But I think you can, I believe that you make a big impact in many different ways as a designer. So I wanted to show you two other projects, not just to show about, talk about the impact, but also to talk about how in our office, with the group of people that we work with, they, um, we don't, things look different from each other. <laughs> it's not very academic, is it? Um, that there is a responsiveness that we have to each place. And I want to show you that during this five year period when we were designing Chang'e, we were also designing this project, which is, which is in downtown um, Chapel Hill. And so we did a master plan and a streetscape studying uh, the two major streets that take you to UNC and um, really just studied. You can see in the light green, we started saying, okay, there's some missing teeth that we wanna link between the kind of existing parks. And so this was the first project that was built. They found a developer and we were actually asked to come on as both the landscape <coughs> architect and the public artist for this project. So when we started this project, um, well, it didn't look like this when we started, but when we started this project, we, we, um, we, you know, we were doing community meetings, we were sitting, and we heard these engineers in the corner wringing their hands about stormwater and where are we gonna put it, we're gonna lose some parking spaces if we, if we have to put a big tank below grade. And so I kind of moved my chair over to their table and I said, you know, I'm really interested in this conversation. And um, a couple weeks later, we started saying, why don't we use that storm water? We could cleanse it, and then we could create, and then if you've ever been to Chapel Hill in the summer, it's hot there. And so our idea was to create this kind of mist fountain, sculptural fountain, and so it's, um, these are some of the, this is a physical model that we made. It's like folded mylar, and then a rhino model we made concurrently. So there's like a lot of different things happening at the same time, um, kind of informing each other. We like to use a lot of um, technology. I can't believe I couldn't remember that word. Um, we like to use uh, the kind of latest technology and responsive technology. So this is one where we started thinking like, it's like as if the whole site is exhaling water. And so we thought, what if this is like a lung and it's actually breathing mist in and out so that the, the mist and the light actually moves back and forth through the sculpture. And we do a lot of mock-ups. So this is our grasshopper model and then some full-scale mock-ups just studying how the folding pattern works, how the perforation pattern works. So this is metal, and we designed uh, the paving pattern so that it's almost like rain droplets that are moving away from the central sculpture. And it's a great amenity for, for the town and for students. And very theatrical, but when there's no water, 
and they, they do have droughts there. Um, there's no fountain. This, this is another very cute kid. I always feel sorry for him in this picture because it looks like he's like walking into the pit of hell or something like that. It's very, um, and he's so like, look at how his hands are behind his back. He's like a 60 year old soul inside of a three year old body. But we love to make places that, that do this. You saw that in the first project where like a father and daughter come and they're like discovering something. You know, I think that's, it's not us telling didactically this is what should happen here, but to, frame, to kind of let people discover that. So the third project within that, so that was stainless steel. Um, this is a private residence. And we don't do very many of them, but um, this client um, was a very unique client. We, um, when they called us, we told them we don't do residential work, and we gave them two other names of other firms that do it. Um, one of them was Michael Blyer, and so, um, so he, the client then, it, it was sort of like he thought I was playing hard to get, but I wasn't. I was just like, we, we don't really do it. And so he came to our office, and um, he was supposed to meet Michael after us. <laughs> so I had recommended a friend of mine, and then he, the client's like, you're hired, which is like the only time that's ever happened to us, but you're hired on the spot, and he canceled the interview with Michael. <laughs> so I think um, we're still friends, though. Um, um, so this is the main house designed by Schwartz Silver, and this is in Lincoln, Massachusetts, very beautiful, bucolic suburb of Boston, and this is where for, this is for our pond. For our pond is one of the ponds that links to Walden Pond, and you may have Thoreau, it's a very historic neighborhood. So just pay attention to this red line. Um, the site is four acres, and we designed the whole area. I think the rule, so this is the site, the view from the house. It's an incredible site. Um, it's got hardwood forests um, that frame the site. But the site itself, this whole area was raised when we came to the site. And so just to show you a little glimpse of how we do planting plans, we never do one planting plan. We think about them seasonally, so early spring, spring. For me, early spring's really important. I think like that March moment where the kind of tulips come up, it's just an amazing moment. So summer and then fall. So this is all the same. So you could see here's that red line again. And just thinking about the kind of tapestry of the landscape and the kind of colors that will transform. This is me yelling at the contractor. No, no. Um, and again, making physical models. So this project started, um, so that red line is, is this fence. Um, it started off as a one-layered flat fence and welded. And as we started working on it, we started thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if it moved? That was like a year and a half later. That's the great thing about residential work is that you just, you can keep working if you have a good client. So these are some physical models that actually move. Um, um, and in fact, we made these first because if, if anyone were to tell you that we drew this plan first, they would be lying, <laughs> right? This is the plan of the fence. This is the section. And we built it in Rhino and, and Axon. So I'm not a big fan of plans because I think the complexity gets lost if that's all you rely on. Um, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six layers of core 10. And so this was, I wanted to show you a little process. Like we had the idea, and then we, this was before we thought about having it move. I dug it up yesterday. It's, we thought, oh, um, what if it had like a, Lay, you know, two layers and we welded it together and it was <laughs> impossible to build. You can see like you can't weld this to that. Um, you know, like everyone quit. <laughs> okay. 
Um, and then this, um, well, th remember this. This is a fence. This is a gate that we designed. But a lot of the fence, we had to kind of uh, build it in Rhino, then build a mock-up to make sure it worked. And then we, then we built it for real. So it was like an arts project. You know, it's like really hands-on sculptural. So the way it was built was that it, um, it came all scrunched up like this. There are six different um, sizes of this solid core 10 bar. And um, they're bolted together. And you can see this crane. And we, we regraded the site so that it brought back the kind of natural came and cattle landscape of this beautiful site. And then essentially, the crane lifts and opens this up. And we pour the footings as we're installing the, so it was really, it fits the land like a glove. But the shape of it is defined by the land. So this is the fence. And so um, you can see that the fence has a kind of varied opening. Um, but the minimum opening is actually the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder dimension of their two dogs. This is like what you can get when you're very, very rich. Um, <laughs> it's um, their German shepherds, Lesko, and I can't remember Lesko's friend's name, but I'm literally on the ground. <laughs> measuring this dog's shoulder to shoulder. And that's why we don't do that much residential work. But um, <laughs> so this, this opening is based on, on, on them. And so the first, um, the first weekend, they invited us to dinner. And they were dog sitting a uh, miniature dachshund. And it just like went right through the fence. It was like, woof. <laughs> so we're like, come on, Penny. <laughs> So basically, the fence is this kind of, uh, it's a corten, so it's this reddish tone. In the summer, it uh, has a beautiful relationship with the landscape. And then in the fall, you can see in these photos, it starts to really merge and blend in with the landscape. And this is their front door. So the only rule they had for us is no lawn. They wanted no lawn. And so everything is this kind of, no, there's no impervious surfaces. So it, this is a project about uh, water as well. This is their front door. And that fence weaves through many different kinds of landscapes. So you can see from above, it, it's, it changes dimension, but it's five or six layers. The, the, that white uh, mock-up that you saw earlier, that's a gate that's located here. After the fact, when we built it, the client said, you know, we, we're sort of trapped in here, sort of like how you guys are trapped in here, right? right? Didn't, you, didn't you say they can't leave? Yes. So <laughs> I could talk about anything. <laughs> can't leave. Um, and so basically they said, I said, well, you know, it's going to mar it if you have a if you have a gate. And so they're like, we don't care. Just put it in, even if you can't see it. So now, to find the gate, you have to kind of go like this. And it's so heavy, because it's solid core 10. But one of my favorite projects. Um, and it goes through all these different kinds of landscapes. And then in the winter, it becomes the star. You know, This is the view from their kitchen here. The overhead view you saw earlier is the view from their bedroom. So, um, so two projects that we did concurrently about nine years ago, um, and I wanted to show you the kind of contrast and relationship. They're both in Chicago. One is a Chicago Botanic Garden. The other one is called the Crown Sky Garden at the Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital. And so, we do a lot of research and work on restorative design, human-centered design, um, design that brings about well-being. And so that, that's a big piece of all the work that we do. Um, within three to five minutes, it has been 
through psychological studies, it's now been shown that within the hospital setting, um, patients, their bodies are uh, normalized when they have, when they are able to engage a landscape, but even when they are in a room where they're, a windowless room, if you give them a painting of a landscape, their, their blood pressure normalizes, the brain circuitry, circuitry in their brain normalizes, blood pressure, everything. And so there's a way in which um, we kind of fell into this because, because we do sculptural work and we're interested in landscape. A lot of these gardens, that's not it, a lot of these gardens are inside. And so you cannot use the standard tools to design these because a lot of these patients are quite fragile. So both of these projects talk about kind of the human brain and trying to create a place for particularly families but children to, um, to kind of enhance the brain, to restore the brain function. So this is in Chicago, the Chicago Botanic Garden. If you've never been to Chicago Botanic Garden, it is one of the most beautiful places in the world and you should go visit. Um, we designed a learning center that's six and a half acres. Um, and um, it is, uh, it's got a um, classroom and central learning space, aquatic center, uh, kitchen garden, and then a play space. And so that, that's kind of the diagram of the project. And we looked at the master plan and how this links to the larger park, to the larger garden. And just starting to diagram, like, how do people move through? You know, this is a very important part of our process to understand how, where things are and how things are programmed. And so this is a perspective view. Um, there are many components to the garden, but the big idea of this garden is to create a place for kids and families to come and put aside a lot of their digital play tools, play things, so that they can actually discover the natural world. Um, I am a big advocate of playgrounds that don't look like playgrounds. I think when it looks like a playground, the kids get bored very, very quickly, and I don't blame them, um, when we predetermine what play is. And so there are a series of these mounds that are inspired by the kind of land formations that you find in the Midwest, and so that, that was part of a kind of teaching moment. A lot of these, um, bo in both these projects that I'm gonna talk about, there are, um, there are materials that we went and looked for. Um, and so these stones, we actually, we had a local partner who helped us locate these stones, and so they're scattered throughout the, uh, the garden as a kind of place to play as well. But the, the, the slopes of these are really, really steep. Some of them are actually two to one. So those of you who know grading, it's like 50%. <laughs> so this, these are, this was finished last year. A lot of people say this is like me and my son, but <laughs> I don't have long hair. <laughs> we um, took some of the trees that we had to take down from the site and we basically carved them and created these kind of nature play elements. So there's a lot about this, uh, about our work that's inspired by the place, you know, we're really flexible. We see something, we're like, oh, you know what, let's replace this with this other, this is beautiful wood, let's do that instead. And there's just, there's a way in which we're collaborating with the site and and the people who, um, who work there, who live there. There's a natural stream in the site and it's fed by the, the lake. So it's a kind of circulation system. We try never to make fountains that are like there's a tank below grade and you know, we try to make it as part of the system. And so this landform piece um, actually becomes an amphitheater, and there's like an ADA access point at that. 
Oh, I'm showing you the brain again. Uh, um, the other aspect of the Chicago Botanic Garden is I do believe that it's really important to give children an opportunity to, to imagine. I think it's so important. And, and there is a lot of uh, research out there that shows the importance of making those synaptic connections when you're very young. So if you give children these playgrounds that are completely predetermined, I think that there is actually actual damage that happens. Um, this is in the middle of downtown Chicago. It is um, along the M Miracle Mile. And it's a brand new vertical hospital that they built. So this is a slide that just shows you the different um, the different processes we use to study this project. Um, this is a pastel sketch that I did, really studying the way in which some of these walls would be laminated, a rhino model. And essentially, um, this, because it was on the 11th floor of, a build, of the building and the interior completely enclosed, it, um, it had a lot of restrictions. Like we couldn't use stone because stone is, um, it actually holds a lot of infectious bacteria <laughs> issues. And so we had to find a material that was hard enough that could be cleaned easily. So we found a fabricator in Los Angeles um, who used eco-resin, uh, eco and it's recycled resin. And each piece is actually cast individually. So each piece is different. Um, we do a lot of these. Um, multi-sensory studies. So this was a drawing that we did very, very early on. It was before we actually even drew up the plan. But it was just thinking like you have this rectangular plot. How do you start to kind of expand the area so that there could be multiple gardens with different kinds of sensor or sens sensory experiences? So through the programming, we, we des designated this as the main performance area and a series of kind of contemplative spaces around it. I wanted to just share with you um, part of our process. Um, we, I don't know if you can see these little figures, but we were trying to find ways of doing these renderings. So these renderings weren't done in Rhino or anything. We actually took snapshots of a physical model that we built. And then we took photographs of these kind of little uh, model figures. They're kind of um, from Germany. They're hand painted. And we photographed them because they actually showed people doing real things. And we wanted to express that. So a mother breastfeeding, um, people who are of different sizes. You know, I think it was something we wanted to try to capture. So this is the project, and these are, so what, uh, what this kind of double layered wall allowed for us to do was to embed all the technology into it. So um, one thing that they didn't want is for kids to touch anything, because that's where the trans transmission of germs happen. So there's actually a sensor up here, like a cutoff, that uh, senses speed. And so basically, depending on how much activity has happened here, it actually changes the kind of imagery of the LED screen behind this. On the 12th floor, there's a, a tree house. And um, it's for the most fragile patients. Um, so you reserve uh, time to go in here, and it's completely enclosed. But you can actually look down. So it's actually right up here. And you can look down into the garden. Um, this was the most, you never know when you're doing a design what's the most controversial part of the project. This was it. We originally had a larger glass floor. There's a history of that in Chicago to kind of go up and look down to the glass floor. Um, the re I can't tell you, I was there probably, I probably spent uh, 40 billable hours on this subject of if this is not frosted, because if it's frosted, you, can, you can't look down, right? So if it's clear, there was this whole discussion about young girls in dresses standing up here, and then 
men who shouldn't be down there, or not just men, I mean, just people down there looking up. And so it was, you know, that's part of the process of executing a design is getting people together, talking about it, and making compromises. So it went from being something that filled this whole area to half the area. Um, we had open water because we thought it would be nice to hear water. But during the, uh, when we fin finished construction documents, a case of Legionnaire's disease, there was an outbreak of that in a hospital in Texas, and they blamed it on the fountain. So uh, the way we uh, responded was we made this bubbler system, but we filled it with marbles. And I personally showed the contractor, I think this might have been my template right here, how to gradate it from blue to red. So I wanted to share with you a piece of this project, which is part of a lot of our projects, is like, what does community process mean? And it's not just like meeting people a few times and having them put some stickers on a board, but we try to really get to know people. And so this is that marble wall, so we wanted to kind of talk. They, they had a family advisory board. This young lady, she started with us when she was like eight years old, and um, by the time we did the rib ribbon cutting ceremony, she was attending nursing school. But when we first met her, she had not yet left the hospital ever in her life. This is really meaningful work for us. Um, this is a picture of us uh, working not just with the community in the hospital, but with local craftsmen. And so we wanted to create these kind of sensory elements with kids' hands. And so what I did was I said, OK, let's put out an ad to the, uh, to the existing children's hospital in Chicago and say, uh, Mick Young Kim Design is coming into town, and we would like uh, we are going to be casting kids' hands, and those bronze casts will be going into the garden. And I had planned on being there for three days because we weren't sure we'd get enough people. And when I arrived, there was a line going around the hall, and there were all these people. And so we started off, I had this idea, a vision, like I wanted little tiny hands, like baby hands, and then teenager hands in a variety. And so we started with the baby hands. And when the fabricator asked us, like, how detailed do you want to get with these hands? How much of the, uh, the texture of the hands do you want to get? And I said, well, as, text as detailed as you can get. And he said, well, it'll be this, this kind of, um, I don't know, this kind of material that you have to hold your hands still for like at least two and a half minutes. So I said, great, we'll do it. <laughs> and so. There was a line of, of young children in these kind of carriages, like a caravan, with their mothers and sometimes fathers um, waiting. So we started the youngest. And the, there are these little babies, and they're so cute. They have that, like an EEG on their head. And we said, OK, let's get started. So we, I put their hand into this cold jelly. And they're like, ha, 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 ha. And they're like, holy shit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, didn't mean to say that. They're like, their face just like, it's like the worst moment of their life. And they're in the hospital. And so I just said, you know, it's like, we tried on the first child. We couldn't make it happen. We tried on the second child. And I just said, I can't do this anymore. I said it to the mother. And the mother's like, Let's just try once more. It's like the pushiest mother. But we, we ended up not getting any young children because we couldn't make it happen. So these two kids are probably in second grade, and they're watching SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> you can see this kid is thrilled to be there. So that's a process. We cast their hands. We, the hospital staff then kind of, we wanted the left and right hand to stay together. So they documented who it was, how old they are, what their name was. Um, and then this was uh, the image of, and so what happens when you put your hand? So you can see in this small image, like the cast is a cast of a cast. Cast is a cast of a cast. And it, so if we had just taken a cast of the cast, this would be sticking out, up. The cast of the cast. So this is how we think. We're like, is that nice? 
to put your hand on a three-dimensional hand. And we thought, no, it's nicer when it's like pressed into the wood. And so you can see that when you put your hands on this cast, there is actually the sound of water that comes out of it. Some of it is cultural sounds, some of it is natural sounds, but they're all sounds of water. Part of our process when we can afford it and when the client allows us is that we'll build full-scale mock-ups on site. So these are all the walls, and we basically, we were unhappy with some of the space, spatial sizes, so we re-spray painted the, and then they, they, re, they um, surveyed the site again and sent us a new CAD plan. Oh, that's me, right here. See, I wasn't lying. That's me putting the marbles in. And that's, that's someone in our office. He was with me. And these contractors would come by and go, there's got to be an easier way, and they'd make, make these little funnels for us. But we wanted to kind of show them with one. Like, we knew they would just dump these marbles in. You can see all these different boxes of different colored marbles, and we thought it was really important to make that gradation. So this is that gradation. These are the walls. Just so, you know, everything's hard. So the bamboos that came in, they didn't fit in the elevator. So, you know, you get a call, you're like, oh. And then, so they had to bring it up the service elevator and cut a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> and so this is what I mean, that the project, I'm here speak on behalf of an incredible team of people, people who are careful. They built this, mo this temporary staircase so that they didn't crack these resin walls as they were installing the um, bamboos. Last story about this project. This is the wood that we used in the project that, were, that have the hands embedded in them. We did not design them until I got a call at around 11 o'clock at night from an urban forester in Chicago. And he said, a, a couple trees that were planted by Frederick Law Olmsted during the Columbian Exposition have fallen during the storm. Would you like them? I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so these are the, we had to share them with some other people, but um, these are, these are, these, this is the wood. And so this is remembering that young woman who is now a nurse in that hospital um, who said, I haven't left the hospital. Can you bring a piece of Chicago into the hospital that I can touch? So this is a piece of Chicago brought, brought for the kids. And this is Bruce. I forgot Bruce's last name, but Bruce and his wife. And they were instrumental. So this is an example of a material we cut them into two-inch slabs, dried them, and when they came out of the kiln, they were all warped, right? Because they dried in different ways. So we came up with a solution for that. So this is, um, this is that hand. What's that cute kid? Um, this is another story, like the wood was rotted. That's why it fell during the storm. And the craftsman said, called me and said, I could cut a piece out of a piece that we carved out of the inside and, and then place it in here, as it, and you wouldn't even be able to tell that there was rot in the wood. And I thought, you know, that doesn't seem right, right? Like, it's healing about that. And so I thought about it, and I thought, well, healing is, often leaves a scar, you know, and it's, it's like, that, that's as beautiful as the kind of perfection of the wood itself. So instead of pretending like it wasn't here, we actually cast it with resin to retain the, the kind of beauty of, I think, this texture. And this is a view from the Prentice Women's Hospital. Um, the last two projects I wanted to talk about, and then you guys will be released. Hey, I see somebody leaving. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, are two projects we're working on now. Um, one we just completed, but uh, the Tanjo Waterfront, which is in 
uh, Tangiers, Morocco, and the Prudential Plaza, Prudential Center, which is in Boston. So this is in Morocco. Um, it's an incredible place. If you've never been there, you should go. It is the gateway to North Africa. And this is the view to the kind of historic part of the city. And this is the view from our site. So you can see Gibraltar from our site. Incredible location. And it, it's a 385-acre site, so it's a redevelopment project. And basically, the site was um, a place where fishermen came. And so it's a, it's a working marina. And so I'm going to be kind of going through this relatively quickly. But basically, with these kind of larger projects, I wanted to talk about the kind of fractal process. So you saw that in the beginning, we had a big project and a small project, and they're kind of working concurrently. But it, what we're finding now is as we're working on these larger projects, within this larger project, we are working on it on the big and the granular at the same time. So we started to develop with the architect, um, Nelson Partners out of Texas, um, the different uh, precincts that we wanted to create. So there's a garden district. There's a market peninsula. There's um, all the cruise ships come into this port here. And they, this is a, a very popular location for uh, people from Spain and Europe to come and vacation. But Tangiers is the place where you know, all these writers came and took a lot of drugs and wrote a lot of good work. Um, We do a lot of study about where do people move. So important. Does it make sense? You can't imagine when you first start doing the drawings and the architect's putting all the buildings in, and then you draw the, like, the desire line of how people are going to get from, let's say, like the, the, uh, the Four Seasons to the marketplace. And it's like it, there's no logical uh, direct line. and so. This, this was a drawing that was done probably a hundred times to make sure that everything was interconnected. Because when you're making, basically we're making a town, you have to make sure that access is easily seen. So this is just a site plan inserted into, like this is the Medina, and this is the area, and then there's a kind of boat launching area. So this diagram became the project. It seems really simple. It's this line that we start to think about, how do we start to make those precincts really clear? And so we started thinking, what if this is a cut and this is an island? So you have to cross bridges to get from here to here. So you really start to make some of these precincts more special. So that's essentially what we did. We basically cut this pier and made a water feed, uh, um, a stepped waterway um, that you can access. So you can see it here. And then there's a beach located here. So there's a series of open spaces um, that we designed. And you'll see these like little uh, circles and lines. And we're always mindful of what the view corridor is doing. Because the other thing, when we started this project, you know, you get bogged down in all the little details. But I, I realized it's all about the water. When you're at the ocean, you always want to just get, to the, get as close to the view of the water. And so we're always looking to make sure that wherever you are, you can see a view of the water. This is the, uh, a view of the main plaza. And so this is the source point of the water as it's moving towards, um, it's getting pumped from the other side from the ocean. So it's a saltwater fountain. Concurrently, as we're developing that master plan, we were also developing these different tapestries. Because in Tangiers, they have an incredible tradition. You walk on the street, and like there's just this incredible tapestries on the ground. So we just developed a kind of a, a kit of parts of different kinds of paving patterns for the different precincts and then different um, tiling patterns for planters, for walls, and things like that. 
So that was a, this was a project where we, we could never afford to build a planter like that here in the US. But in Morocco, you can, because this is what they do. So these were some of the important precincts along that boardwalk that frames the experience. And just a detail of some of the um, paving patterns. And so they were building up mock-ups as we were developing the master plan. And that's the kind of fractal language that we're trying to develop. So you'll see in these perspectives, a lot of people who do planning, let me rephrase, um, a lot of planners who look at these larger scale things, when they're actually doing these perspectives, this element and that element have not been designed yet. But because we worked at two different scales, kind of bringing them together, um, these perspectives that we did some of and other people and the renderers did others, we, we started to, we know this is the design, right? This is the paving pattern. And it comes from the kind of carpets that we saw in Tangiers. This is the beach with the kind of pop-up market. <laughs> with, with like a surfer dude. <laughs> um, the boardwalk with the planters. And just looking at the connectivity again, I just want to, I always come back to this. Um, we were looking at how do you create thresholds in this project? So these are some pictures in Tangiers when we were there. It's incredible how they announce thresholds everywhere. It's like, you're entering a new precinct. And I think that's what makes this city so great. I love these three-dimensional ones where you have a gate within a gate within a gate or like a gate within a gate. It's so beautiful. Um, and just even on the interiors, it's like a Matisse painting, right? But this is where the hotel we stayed in. And so we started to, like with these smaller parks, we started to think about how do we take that idea of a gateway and modernize it? So um, you can see that we started to think about creating the volume, but also creating those various shapes. And so there, this is a, you can, you can see in this plaza, we've, we, um, in the master plan, we designed this detailed paving pattern that gradates out to the boardwalk, but also, bless you, but also this gateway. And so this, you can see it better here. We're still studying this, um, but just understanding, like, you really simplify it. You just make the outline of it rather than the volume. This took, like, four months to figure out. <laughs> you know, it's hard to believe, right? Um, this is Tangiers. Um, this is actually our design leader in our office. He, he doesn't usually dress like this, but um, we went into a store and pretty soon he had a fez on, but they, I, I didn't get a picture. Um, but just the kind of the detail and the, um, the color and the, the tapestry, that's something we tried to capture in this project. The views. Oh, okay. So these are the views. And I want to just, at each of these circles, we design those destinations. So instead of a boardwalk, which is a wood boardwalk all the way around, um, we decided that we wanted to create these destination points. And so this is the one I want to talk about today. Um, it has an incredible view to Gibraltar. And so what we decided was we would design this kind of um, multi-level viewing platform. So this was one iteration of it. And then this is the final iteration made of glass. And though, I mean, obviously, obviously you're gonna have some handrails and stuff in here, but this was, um, so this is the Medina in the distance and then at night. So right now we're studying like, should it be glass block or should it be made like a building with a glass facade? Um, and then just a last image of the kind of carpet. Um, this is a historic gateway that they had closed off and we had proposed for them to open it up. And this is the gateway to the Medina. So you can actually climb under, within the grade 
into the Medina. And so we're opening that up. So this is the gateway to that historic Medina. And then this is that carpet that we're making towards that entrance. So you can see little details. This is not something that we've borrowed from somebody else's project. All of this is patterning that we've designed ourselves. So an aerial. I hate these kind of drawings, but it just gives you a sense. This is the cut through the site. Um, and concurrently, we were working on this project. Obviously, this is getting built faster. But this is in downtown Boston. Um, this is the Prudential Mall. Many of you may have shopped there. It is the highest grossing retail center in New England. So its square footage is quite high. And what they did was they basically decided to add a volume in front of the existing building. Um, the Fens is here, Boston Commons, Copley Square, and Boston Street. So Newberry Street is the fancy street. It's where all the boutique stores are. And Boylston Street sort of the poor cousin that they're trying to redevelop. Um, so we're working on this project, we're working on this project, and another project down the street. And then plenty of other landscape architects are, are filling in the missing teeth. Um, oh, I should have brought the slide of the first one, but I didn't. OK, so remember I was talking about circulation, so important. So the first diagram we had when we started this project was sort of like, it was like everything was at a 90 degree angle, right? And so it was assuming like that people walk like, like this and then they take a right angle like this. So we stopped because it started making a, a design that wasn't very interesting. We said, if there was nothing in the plaza, how would people get to the front doors? So this was a very difficult project because there were seven front doors, each equally important. This is the front door to the Eataly Marketplace. This is the front door to their office tower. These are retail front doors. And these are escalators up to the mall. So each was equally important. So we had to figure out how to do that. And so this was the ultimate diagram that shaped the project. In fact, the circulation shaped the project. So you can see that diagram in here. I mean, it's much more complex. But essentially, the, plant, the planters, this is above a parking garage, are shaped by the circulation diagram. Really, the desire lines. What's the fastest way when you're coming down Boston Street that you want to come in to this area? So this is Boston Street. The Heinz Convention Center is here. Um, and this is just street life in Boston. And so all those little portals that we showed in the diagram, this is them. You know, this idea that the planter kind of creates these spaces, not only that people can pass through as a threshold, but also that it's a place where people can sit. And we really believe that that like 30 foot buffer that we put between the street and the central plaza was crucial to make this place successful. Halfway through the project, um, we got a, a wind study done by a consultant. And we found that the entire site is windy. Like just on any given day, it's so windy. And the bu new building made it worse. And so these were, um, this is a developer project. And so the thought of even putting a few trees to block their signage was like, it was like very painful, painful discussions. And so we, you know, one day I just said, you know what? Let's embrace the wind. There's nothing you're going to do unless you enclose the, this entire space. So essentially, these wind studies became the guiding principle of the project, the concept of the project. We developed these wind vanes that actually move with the wind. And the wind ha the, each wind vane has a light underneath it. And the color of the LED is tied to a NOAA sensor, NOAA, which is that uh, weather. And um, these are the NOAA colors. And so depending on the intensity of the wind, that is reflected in the colors of these wind vanes. So when there's a storm and the plaza is red, you know, you better get out of there. <laughs> Yeah, and I think those wind studies were incorrect because I've only seen this red color once. 
it's mostly blues and purples. But. So what happened after that was when we said, oh, let's embrace the wind, they said, the, the, develop, the client said, what if we make an iconic wind vane, wind, not wind vane, um, turbine, wind turbine at the roof. And then they started adding all this other stuff. They had solar panels. We collected all the rainwater on the roof so that this plaza is completely self-sustaining. It's all fed by all of this action on the roof. This is a plan. And we kind of, we love paving. I think it's really important in the landscape. It's the carpet that defines the experience. So this is the office um, entry. And we designed a roof garden for the Italy marketplace. It has a retractable roof so they can come out and, and party. And so even the planters are defined by this kind of concept of this windswept landscape. So they all kind of come off of the paving and then rise up and create these. But the other thing that this does is that all along here, the slab in the garage is really weak. And they didn't want to spend the money to reinforce that slab. So it did two things. We were like addressing structural issues. I wanted to just talk about the planter walls a little bit because we used the Rhino technology to build it. And this technology allowed for us to get as close to the actual making of this landscape. Um, we started with these big slabs of stone. And then, um, so this is Ian Downing and Sam Partington in our office, and they were the project managers. Um, Sam was the construction manager. Um, she whipped everyone into shape. Um, and so it was really difficult to convince the client. We even had Cold Springs come to a meeting to convince them that it, modularizing the planter didn't make it less expensive. That because we had this technology, um, everyone who looks at this project, they go, hmm, looks expensive. And it, it wasn't inexpensive, but it, it, because we used this new technology, it didn't matter. Um, but the client didn't believe us. And so they made us make two of the planters uh, the same. And then they got really angry when the contractor didn't lower the price. Um, so this is one of the planters. You can just see. And we studied this for like a year. We printed it out. We, we added clay to see if it would look nicer at the corner. You know, it's very. So you could see each one of these units is different. And then the other, I talked to you about the slab condition. So we had to step the foundation. And uh, nine years ago, we would have never been able to build this project. Because imagining a contractor fitting a kind of curved surface on top of a stepped foundation, it's, you couldn't imagine it. But there were really no problems. So each one, that's why each one of these has a shape on the front and the back, because the bottom also has a shape. So these are some of the different kind of sinuous forms of this granite, and they're solid chunks. Um, and just a model of the veins and the, so this is just some drawings of the light veins and how they basically, there's a light down here, it shines up to here, and this is a, a custom uh, coil system. So it's one piece of metal that coils up. And I don't know if you can see it, but the coil is more dense at the bottom and opens up as it gets to the top. So we made lots of studies. Should it be round? Should it be a hockey puck? It's more like this. There's no structural engineer in Boston who was willing to stamp these drawings. So we had to. Uh, we had to find some, some manufacturer who's willing to, to design both the kind of the system that allows for this to rotate. But really, these civic places, they are places where, where people get together. They are community, places for the community to engage. I think that 
the client really wanted these light poles because they wanted a place where people would engage social media and take a picture of themselves in front of it as the lights were changing. But for us, we're really about making places that allow for people to express to that, that it's kind of a foundation which different kinds of activities can happen. Now, this central plaza has become so successful. I don't have actually any pictures of it, but every weekend there's some kind of event or concert. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Questions. We're doing that right now. So we're designing. Oh, sure. So there's a question about um, whether we use virtual reality as a way kind of to get even closer to the project. And yes, we do. So we're doing these. Um, I don't know if you know what anamorphic art is, but it's this kind of art when you look at one point of view, you can see like a complete image. You see like a face. And then when you turn here, it sort of breaks up. So we're doing that for a university. We're creating their sign, 20 feet tall, but it's anamorphic. And so we're using virtual reality to convince the school that it works. Yeah. Any other questions? So yeah. the question is, um, what, how does maintenance shape the work that you do, and does it make you yeah. sad when it's low maintenance? Mm. Um, You know, it's like a parent who has five children, you say, who's your favorite child? Um, I think that we, we know generally up front if a client cannot afford a lot of maintenance or they don't have the capacity for that. But it doesn't make us feel that it's a lesser project. Sometimes the challenges of a project makes the project better. Like if the project's limitless, like it has a limitless budget, it's, uh, you know, they have 5,000 people taking care of it. You know, I think that as a designer, it does help you frame your thinking because value engineering, which is the term we use to say, we can't afford it, you gotta cut something out, is a really, it, it forces you to say what's important about the project. And so for us, like some projects are low maintenance because of the phenomenological forces on the site. And you know, for us, that doesn't make us sad. That makes us excited. You know? But um, in Korea, that was a project where I truly didn't believe them that there was the kind of, that that entire basin would get filled with water. But they were right, and I was wrong, so. Anybody else? Questions? Yes. Oh, when it was flooded? Yes. You know, usually when it's flooded, it's quite dangerous because uh, it's in the middle of a storm. So they don't want to encourage people to, to come there. but. I think that there was a way in which we were able to incorporate up to what we call a 100-year storm. So those ramps that we showed actually are registrations of the different levels. But beyond that, the city did not want us to create anything that, w that like ramped people down to the water when there's something beyond a 100-year storm. So there are like a lot of safety issues that we have to take into consideration as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.